Michael's becoming a habitué of the department. Uh, last time he was here, <laughs> twice this has happened. He risked directing Alan Akebourne. I did. In front, in of, front Alan. of Alan. In front of Alan So, uh, So this is worse. I mean, talking on Jacobean Theatre before, before the director of Tispegis of Whore. So. Right. And we've also got another uh, close friend of TFTV here, Pelkey Walton, tonight, front row. But we, she too has relevant expertise, but we'll talk at and past her nervously. <laughs> awesome. Um, we thought we'd talk around the subject of Jacobean theatre on the modern stage. We both have the impression that there's too little of it recently. Yes. Um, and there has been a decline. I think there has been a visible decline uh, in the number of productions of Jacobean plays, I think for lots of reasons. Money, obviously, you know, subsidy declining and all of that. Um, we live in an age, I noticed, just on that subject, where when the Arts Council, when the government announces a 5% cut in the arts budget, we're all supposed to stand up and cheer and say, this is wonderful. It's not a 15% cut, yeah. but that's another matter. But so money is tight, so therefore we get fewer revivals. I think also it depends who is running which theatre. Um, Michael Boyd, for instance, who's been running the RSC very capably for the last <coughs> decade, is not, it seems to me, a man who's that much interested in that particular Elizabethan Jacobean work. Greg Doran, who's taking over and has taken over the RSC, is. And I think the RSC will therefore go back to using the swan as a base for that kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's part of a larger um, uh, syndrome, which is, I would say, a declining awareness or interest in the classic theatre in this country. I mean, we're very good at, obviously, staging modern plays, thank God. Uh, Shakespeare we do. But again, Shakespeare, what do we do? We do the same 12 plays, year in, year out. Every year I get invited to about 10 productions of A Midsummer Night's Dream. You know, I get very few to Time of Athens or Coriolanus. I just feel we've narrowed the Shakespeare repertory down. And Peter Holland, I know, is here. I don't know whether Peter would agree. Um, and in the process, I think we've narrowed the classic repertory down. Another thing that's gone are those wonderful uh, sort of middleweight touring companies like Prospect, for example, who used to revive plays you know, from the classic repertory. So for all sorts of reasons, to do with money, to do with decline of touring theatre, the classic repertory is not as available as it used to be. I mean, just tiny examples. One of the plays that influenced Harold Pinter very uh, much when he was a young uh, student at Hackney, you know, a schoolboy, was being taken by a schoolmaster to see The White Devil. Where? In the West End of London, you know, mm -hmm. with Robert Helpman and Margaret Rawlings. This was 1946-47. Um, I feel I was lucky. I grew up in the Midlands, where there was not only, obviously, Shakespeare at Stratford. Birmingham Rep, in the late 1950s and early 60s, allowed me to see everything from Aristophanes, you know, through to um, Ben Jonson, Restoration comedy, 18th century comedy, up to Bernard Shaw. And I got a sort of education in world drama by going to that theatre. Mm -hmm. And I think it's harder now for young people to get that kind of broad picture of the world repertory. Mm -hmm. I mean, thankfully, departments like yours are keeping these plays alive. For three nights. For three, for three nights. nights, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, it just worries me that although our theatre in many, many ways has improved enormously uh, in my lifetime, in this one area, making the classics available, I think it has actually undergone something of a decline. There's always been a distinction between the two big companies in this, it seems to me, um, because uh, partly because the Royal Shakespeare Company got in those few years ahead. Yes. Because uh, 1960, the foundation of the Royal Shakespeare Company, National Theatre at a very advanced embryonic stage, but not there yet. Yes. Uh, Olivier at Chichester burnt his fingers terribly with two Jacobean into the Caroline part, didn't he? and the chances, yes. um, both of which barely season. flopped. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. And Uncle Vanya, a balanced programme. Um, uh, so he was, he was gingerly. Uh, then they tried in their first season, I'm, I'm leading with my chin with this one, a yes. uh, very successful production of Falk was the recruiting officer, which yes. is one of those classic productions that made it seem as if you can take plays from the pre-1800 repertory and make them absolutely vividly present. And the director, William Gaskell, then went on in the summer to a f famous catastrophe with a play called The Dutch Courtesan. Yes. Um, and right. and yes. then you know, I think it unnerved them because there is not a follow through. And just at that moment, the RSC started coming through with the great production of Jewel Malta, yes. then Revenge's Tragedy. It was as if that was their repertory. And it's never worked for the National since. There have been one-offs, but there's no continuity. And that's a major deficiency in a national company. But in a sense, it, it is the RSS repertory, obviously, because, because they're doing Shakespeare yeah. as the core repertory, then therefore it makes sense they would do 
the non-Shakespeare Elizabethan and Jacobean plays, doesn't it? Secondly, the Swan, when it was first built, was created, you remember, specifically mm. for plays from 1580 to 1720, I think. Uh, that lasted two seasons, and now, I mean, understandably, you know, they now do plays from all, all periods. All I'm saying is I just think um, the classic repertoire is diminishing and has diminished in my lifetime, and maybe we'll come on to this. I think there are other reasons. I think we're becoming nervous of language, the richness of language of Jacobean drama particularly, and the difficulty sometimes of that language, is something that frightens us and makes us mm. apprehensive. I think there are two big issues, really. One is the language, how do we cope with it? And the other one is, in what period do we do these plays? Do we treat these plays as documents of their time? Or do we treat them as plays that need every sort of artificial aid we can, we can give them and need updating? You're looking rather... Well, I, 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 it, <laughs> was just the re it was just the reference to artificial aid, since you were about to see an updated production of <laughs> well, right. Dutch Courtesan, you know. I, mean, <laughs> well, I, I didn't think of it quite like that. But no, yeah. All right, well, let me make my position clear. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll have a glass of water. <laughs> I mean, the issue of, of updating plays comes up time and time again, doesn't it? And people often say, you know, oh, are you for it or against it? And it seems to me the question is meaningless. It's a case-by-case -case scenario, isn't it? And I, in my life, don't see many updated versions of Shakespeare and other classics that have illuminated the plays. Uh, and equally, I've seen many sort of so-called, you know, period productions that have been deadly. I mean, one can only judge it according to each single production. Um, and thinking back, you know, before this, before this um, talk, um, a play like The Alchemist, mm -hmm. I must have seen about sort of eight, nine, ten productions of it. Um, some of them have been in modern dress. In fact, two of the best I've seen were in modern dress. Uh, there was one that Tyrone Guthrie did, I think, right. in the early 1960s at the Old Vic in the Michael Elliott years uh, that was extremely good. Um, but equally, I've seen productions that have done it in picture. Trevor Nunn did a very good one at the other place with Ian McKellen and John Woodbine, I think, some years ago. So, I mean, there's a play, you know, that can take mm. um, modern dress or not. I happen to like, though I don't think you did, Nicholas Heitner's production no, of it. I, didn't. <laughs> I, I, I look at Peter here, but <laughs> what was your objection? Oh, I just didn't think it had got rhythm. Um, I, 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 I'd never seen a production of The Alchemist that blew every major funny line in the way it did. There, there are very easy lines in Alchemist. <laughs> yeah. There are very simple, absolutely, these are so perfectly plotted that you just let that line go out there. And every one of them was blown uh, because the energy was well, going somewhere else. When the drug of the little tobacco that's played by a nation act in that production said, uh, remember, I like to give her a fuckus, you know, remember? Uh, not the performance I saw, but oh, I didn't oh think right. of that as quite one of those. Okay. Um, oh, no, I'm quite thing like, Yeah. Oh, no, 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 I wasn't. I wasn't. Uh, no, it's, th it's things like Ananias coming on in the middle of a fight yes. uh, and the whole stage stops. And he says what has been planted as his key line. Uh, and it's the one he would say, please be upon the house. And they all start fighting again. Uh, and you get that vast dividend. I in the national production, that was said in the middle of the fight. So the audience didn't hear it. So I, I thought the structural thinking wasn't good. But my point would be The Alchemist is a play that can quite easily take. Oh, no. Dress, oh, I, I, I'm not worried. Yes, I, absolutely on that. Because of the subject matter. I well, and, and the codes need to be palpable. I mean, the dress codes, the social status, the transformations yes, but it's need about, to be palpable it's to mankind's audience. perennial urge to be duped, isn't it? And, you know, the existence of con men in society and con men only survive because people want to be mm. uh, duped, don't they? And want to have their dreams fulfilled. So the play has a perennial topicality. All I'm saying is I think that's a play that can be adjusted. I remember seeing it in 18th century costume with Birmingham Rep. That's a play that can take yeah. lots of different periods. Other plays, I think, see, Bartholomew Fair, Ben Johnson's a very interesting one, isn't it? That seems to be an Elizabethan documentary, actually. That seems to be a play about what life was like at that particular moment, you know, that particular fair, uh, or Jacobean documentary. Um, once you update it, make it Victorian or whatever, Edwardian, it doesn't quite have the same resonance. So all I'm saying is yes. no, updating is neither good nor bad in itself. It depends on the integrity with which it's done. So the jury's out on Dutch courtesan. Well, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not, I try not to be dogmatic, I'm just saying... No, I, I completely agree. There are play, uh, rec in recent years, we talked about this beforehand, in recent years I've moved towards modern dress, among other reasons, because there comes a point later in rehearsals when if you're working with Jacobean or restoration costume, you surrender the production to the wardrobe. Mm -hmm. Because there's just a time period of getting it right, which means posture and movement and all that. You've tried all the way through rehearsals to get that right, but not until those dresses come on is it actually 
a real challenge that they're facing. And I hate losing the actors at that point. Oh, I, I want to work with the actors. I mean, on this show, confession time, we change things on Monday night, uh, quite drastically, as far as the ending goes. So I want that freedom, and I, I hate being taken out. So I now choose plays that I think will take that. I mean, there's a play that we've done it with the second years in just in, in, in the course this year, which I would love to direct, and was the first one I ever edited, Bo Stratagem. Mm -hmm. But I probably won't do that because I don't think you can take that out of its period. Right. I, I think there are very precise things about uh, marriage and social codes, about the particular kind of in it is and everything, which I don't know what the modern equivalent would be. So, so I, d I don't want the hassle of the consequences of that, as it no, were. No, right. Um, I think that updating is one issue. I think the other issue is to do with text and yeah, language. Surely. And I think we were just talking briefly a moment ago about the, the difficulty often of the language in these plays. Um, what, how, do you, how do you resolve that? How do you tackle it? Can I talk about a very specific mm. example, which I know is close to your heart, because it's a play that you've done, Middleton's A Mad World, My Masters, which I just saw a week ago done by the RSC, or did I? Because I went to see Thomas Middleton's A Mad World, My Masters, and what I actually saw uh, was a new version uh, adapted, edited, I think is the word they've used, uh, by Sean Foley. And it's Phil not Porter. our meaning of edited, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what you get in this production at the RSC, which has got ecstatic reviews from many of my colleagues, what you get is, um, well, you get a fifth of the original text cut. No great problem with that, necessarily. But then you get the characters' names changed, a lot of them, and you get a lot of the jokes changed. And I'll give you a very specific example in one moment. But can we just talk about the characters' names? Where mm -hmm. do you stand on this? Because, for example... In Middleton's original, there's a character, a crucial character, called um, Sir Bounteous Progress. Well, you know, in this production at the RSC, he becomes Sir Bounteous Peer Sucker. Well, it seems to me Sir Bounteous Progress contains all the information Middleton wants to give you, doesn't he? About mm -hmm. a man who is open-handed, you know, gregarious, generous in many ways, um, but progress, socially conscious, socially mobile, in awe of, you know, r money and status and class and all the rest of it. Why change it? Would you say? Well, he, uh, uh, he partly blames me in the program for his choice of changing it. So I, 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 I did workshops for the production uh, and have written the program note, trying very carefully, not completely, to consent to the production uh, in the process. Uh, he asked me what progress meant. Uh, I, I gave an explanation, and he now claims that that's why he changed it. Yeah. Pro progress was partly I, I, in 1600. It means the king or queen's movement round the the nation. So Pilgrim's progress is an inversion. It's every man's progress, right? Uh, so so he, he didn't understand why he was called that, but the guys built what were called prodigy houses. I mean, houses that only make sense in order to take state visits. They have no organic relationship with the community around them. But we never so he immediately, that, immediately launched from that into, yes. you know, corrupt guy in the House of Lords, yes. and hence that name, yes. uh, which is, you know, actually to misunderstand most things, really, basically. But to take another example, I mean, I think one of the funniest names in Middleton's play is Master Short Rod Hairbrain. Um, <laughs> well, Short Rod tells you what you need to know, and Hairbrain also tells you what you need to know. And the point of the character is he's insanely jealous, isn't he, about it, and possessed about his wife. He's hairbrained, scatterbrained. Well, and, and his mind twitches on everything, so it goes like you yes. know, hair moving. So what's he become in this production? Mr. Little Dick. Well, it's, it's, it's sort of half the joke, isn't it? But it's not the other half. Well, and the other thing is that you only find out quite late in the play that he's also called Short Yard. It, it comes out in the dialogue yes. quite late. He's been called the other name. So to make him only the one name is to malform the Can I just take, take a more specific example? There's one very tiny little scene in the play, and I just wanted to quote Middleton's version and then the other version, the Foley version. I mean, this is when Sir Bounteous, whatever we call him, Progress, um, is bidding good night. Uh, to follow which, who in this production is his nephew. Um, and there's music going on in the background because he's very partial, isn't he, to music, and there's consorts of vials, etc. And this is a bounty of speaking to his, his nephew. You must pardon us, my lord, hasty cates. Your honour has had e'en a hunting meal on and now I am like to bring your lordship to as mean a lodging, a hard down bed, if faith, my lord, poor cambric sheets, and a cloth of tissue canopy. The curtains, indeed, were wrought in Venice with the story of the prodigal child in silk and gold. Only the swine are left out, my lord, for spoiling the curtains. <laughs> Twas well prevented, sir. Silken rest, harmonious slumbers, and venereal dreams to your lordship. <laughs> the like to kind Sir Bounteous. Fine not to me, my lord, I'm old, past dreaming of such vanities. Old men should dream best. Their dreams indeed, my lord, you've given it to us. Tomorrow, your lordship shall see my cocks, my fish ponds, my park, my champion grounds. 
I keep chambers in my house, can show your lordship some pleasure. So bounteous, you overwhelm me with delights. Once again, a musical night to honour. I'll trouble your lordship no more. It's a tiny scene, isn't it? But it's got a lot in it, hasn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. The bit I love is about the curtains, you know. Mm -hmm. The curtains are wrought in Venice. Not the prodigal son, the prodigal child, he says, in silk and gold. Only the swine are left out for oh. spoiling the curtains. <laughs> um, and also there's dirty jokes in there, aren't there? Venereal dreams, etc. And it, this sort of texture, would you agree? Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Texture yeah. and richness mm. in that little passage of dialogue. And what it becomes in the improved version um, by Sean Foley... <laughs> Uh, is much shorter. Sir Bounteous, silken rest, harmonious slumbers, and venereal dreams to your lordship. Folly wit, the like to kind Sir Bounteous. Sir Bounteous, fie not to me, my lord, I'm old past dreaming of such vanities. But tomorrow your lordship shall see my cock, my hens, tickle my trout, and make merry in my champion grounds. Sir Bounteous, you overwhelm me with delights. Once again, a musical night, your honour, I'll trouble your lordship no more. Good rest, Sir Bounteous. So come our masks, where are the our disguises? In your lordship's portmanteau. So it's abbreviated, isn't it? All the lovely stuff about the bed, you know, is gone. And the joke about tomorrow you'll see my cocks, my fish, my ponds, my puck, comes down to a little sort of simple carry and on. Tickle the trap it? joke. It's yeah. a laugh, but. So I, I assure you, if you look on our website, you'll see we kept all of that dialogue. No, I'm just, I'm sure <laughs> just, just one to, you know. But I'm just an example of how, in the desire to make a play, available and accessible to a modern audience, you, what you often seem to do, or what can be done, is to rob it of the, I don't know, the feel of it. Do you yeah. know the te I keep using well, the texture. Well, Middleton's characters negotiate with each other by the games they play with language. Yes. And they, uh, in each set of characters plays a different kind of game. But wh um, wh and if you lose that, you're, you're leaving him behind. But this is, my, this is my question, really. It's not, I haven't got an answer to it, but where do we stop? I mean, yes, it's good to try and make these plays accessible, in every way we can, whether by modern costume or whatever. But when it comes to rewriting, what is legitimate and what isn't? Um, I feel that, you know, the angle of attack is turning here. No, you'll find, attack. You'll find, <laughs> it's a question. You'll find in the programme note tonight a, an explanation of what I've done with this text. Um, I'm, I, I've, um, I've changed words that I think will actually obstruct the audience, mm -hmm. uh, but I've only substituted words which were current in the period in a meaning which is now accessible, so I've not used anything which is anachronistic. Um, I have inserted a few phrases mm -hmm. to help. I mean, there's one I told my, uh, Michael earlier, which involves someone actually taking an aphrodisiac, but none of you would now know that that substance could possibly be an aphrodisiac. So we've actually added a phrase, which Katie speaks. Uh, uh, not, not to get a laugh, but just to actually make clear what's happening um, at that moment. So I've done those kinds of adjustments. That, that's all. Plus one other change we might talk about in a while. But okay. What yeah. about Shakespeare, though? I mean... For example, a lot of Shakespeare is difficult, well, isn't it? Nick well, Heid Heidner's done it Heidner, with Othello. Nick Heidner read yeah. a piece the other day saying, you know, as a director, he finds a lot of the text difficult and obscure. At what point do you start to say, well, therefore we've got to do something about this? I could give you one example, which was a very famous one in its day, before my time and before yours, actually. Peter Brook in 1946, I think, oh, yeah. at, at Sterling <laughs> did a production of King John with Paul Schofield as the bastard. And Bastard has a very famous speech in which he talks about commodity and this being the vice of the age. Commodity, commodity, commodity. And Brooks said, well, no one will know what you're talking about. So they change it to expediency, which is a perfectly good synonym. But it seems to me <coughs> Schofield was a great enough actor, I'm sure, to make an audience aware of what commodity meant. Isn't it the job of the actor to make words that seem to us slightly difficult uh, clear and apparent? I mean, isn't that what acting is partly about? Y yes, but, uh, I mean, that, that seems to be an extreme instance because yeah. uh, the speech then is all about the definition of what commodity is. Yes. So if the audience hasn't immediate access to the meaning, that the speech well delivered will begin to unravel but it. But the context makes it clear. Shakespeare makes it clear by context. <laughs> but, but the amount of, sh I mean, when you're not doing a slim text like that, yes. the amount of dialogue you are shifting uh, in, in, a, in a relatively full production of a Jacobean play means that a lot of it is going by the audience very, very fast. And if there are major obstructions there on the way, you can find the audience completely parting company from the play. So I'm, 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 I'm in favour of medical inserts there <laughs> in order to assist. Um, I, I, a lot tonight, if we stop the clock and turned out to the audience and said, do you know that, explain, do you understand exactly what that phrase means? Then probably there would be a degree of looking away. Yeah. Uh, it happened. I hope, however, any moment where 
in our judgment, it's critical that the audience is absolutely with it, we've either done the text as it stands because it will absolutely communicate now, or we have slightly adjusted. But in any Elizabethan or Jacobin play, there are boundary words that we do not mm -hmm. understand. Oh, and, and this play partly, because yes. there's, a, there's a, a, ma a man who is mad with language in it, uh, partly wants you to be confused by one of the characters in particular as a warning. But what I'm saying, does it matter if, we, if the audience does not understand every single word? And again, it's, it's the job of the actor to clarify that word. I mean, just to take a very common example from the most popular play of all, Hamlet says, who would fardels bear? Well, if you stop the audience and say, what's a fardel? I mean, not many people would have an instant <laughs> definition. But, but I, every actor I've ever seen is capable of making it clear yeah, that a father beca is because of the next line. Burden. Because the next line explains it to groan and sweat. Yeah, so so, burden, so yes. your mind goes on there. Whereas there are other moments when father might crop up. I, I cannot quote you one right. uh, where it would be actually much more obstructive and, and difficult. I remember um, Nicol Williams saying, "Who would fardels bear?" And suddenly, fardels became this yeah, well, terrible, you know, insupportable burden on any human being. So again, the context so, made it clear. Right, yes, but, 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 uh, but the speech does as well in that case. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think you are going to hit reefs. And, uh, uh, if your position is never change... Not never, not never. No, I'm just saying I think we need to ask why we're changing. And I think the danger is of underestimating audiences, which I honestly do think that oh, I know. Mad World My Masters has done, underestimating the audience's capacity for understanding. I mean, I reread the play, you know, Dave Paul Singh, and I, I the bits I didn't understand, but I didn't have a problem with it. I thought an audience wouldn't either. But I'm not prepared to fight on that ground. I no. mean, I've, I've had an uneasy relationship with it. I mean, I was, the, the RSC have been disgraceful on Middleton, basically. Uh, this is one of the top, the greatest dramatists who's ever written uh, in the language, and they've so far done the, his two most famous plays, one of them with a very distinguished Livia uh, in it, but, but they are the most obvious central plays, Changeling and Women Were Women, and one of his really lesser plays, The Old Law, under another title, and they've not got at all into the central repertory of the big comic masterpieces uh, from Mad World through to Chase Maid, um, and they should have been doing them. So I've loved the fact that they're doing it. Uh, I was part of the development process for it uh, two years ago, um, uh, but my heart sank when he began to explain to me what he wanted to do with it. And I, I think it's a pity that it's not had a chance on, more, on something that are more like its own terms when it's come in. On the other hand, it might unlock the possibility of more Middletons being done at Stratford. So yeah, but it, this it is, as far as I know, that production at Stratford Madrid my House, it's only the second professional production I can trace in the last four yeah, years. And the other one was this one, The Globe. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So yeah. therefore, you know, the play is not exactly known. Um, comes back to another point. With Shakespeare, I'm, I'm more open-minded about what you can do with Shakespeare because of the frequency with which the main plays are revived anyway. But with, with someone like Middleton, whose work is rarely seen, on the rare occasions we do see it, then I have a hunger to see the play as written. That's all I'm really suggesting. I, I, there's a line in... Uh, uh, there's a great scene in, in, in Dutch Courtesan, a courtship scene, where quite suddenly uh, the woman who might get married just erupts with all about all all the things a wife must do and a husband may do. And one of the lines in the original is, if a liberty, we must live upon unwholesome reversions. Hmm. What do you do with that? It's the climax of the speech. Keep it. Well, you're going to be, <laughs> you're going to be disappointed tonight. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have put in an explanatory alternative. Right. Because it means <coughs> he, bring, he might bring syphilis home. Right. Right. And I do want her to be able to say that, yes. uh, because just be eruptively, because uh, the, hus the husband-to-be has got to cope with that. Yes. And there's no way, there's no way a modern audience is going to understand that's what she means. Right. So, and I put in a very chaste rendering, it does not even use the word syphilis. Right. Uh, but, but I hope it makes clear... What, what the line I is. won't tell you what the line is, okay. you can wait for that moment. But uh, I, I'm... Uh, uh, oh, no, no, it's, it's even more than I actually said. Sorry, I, I, I switched into our paraphrase there. Uh, the original is, if a loose liver, we must live upon unwholesome reversions. It's me who's ch switched it to liberty. Uh, so so you, you've got a phrase which is climactic and turns the conversation, but there is no way 98% of a modern audience would know what was being said there. Right. So, so it's that kind of intervention I'm talking about. Right. And it seems to me that will help, uh, help the actress, I think, in this case. Yes. My point is simple. I, I want to see more Jacobin plays done on the British stage. Uh, secondly, I'm perfectly open-minded about what period you do them in. Um, although, I still think the British theatre in general at the moment 
is updating and adapting almost everything. And what we're losing sight of is theatre's capacity to be a kind of time capsule whereby you can actually unlock the past by staging it. I mean, just a couple of examples of directors who've done this in my lifetime. Peter Stein, the great German director, has an extraordinary capacity for making you feel when you're watching his production, say, of Chekhov, that you're watching something from your memory, so your memory of the past. And he's done it with all the classic plays of his I've ever seen. Um, you feel you're not <coughs> watching a sort of uh, revivication of the past, you're being transported to the past. And I once asked him about this, and I said, how actually do you achieve this? Because he did a Julius Caesar, a remarkable Julius Caesar, where he employed half the Austrian army for the crowd scenes, and suddenly got a sense of what it might have been like to be present in the forum with you know, chaos erupting and everything descending into anarchy. And he said something very interesting. Um, he said, well, one of the key things about doing old plays is getting the sound of the feet right. You know, right. The, the, the surface, um, the sound that the shoe makes on the floor surface. And he said, if you're doing a Roman play, for example, you know, you have to remember that it would probably be in sandaled feet on a sort of harsh marble surface. And you have to try and recapture that sound. It had never occurred to me that that's one way mm -hmm. of making you feel you're somehow being transported into the past. Another director <coughs> who only did it, I think, very briefly was Katie Mitchell. Mm -hmm. I remember she did a production of Ibsen's Ghosts for the RSC. And she and her designer went to Norway <coughs> and studied the landscape and the light above all. And they captured something I'd never seen before in an Ibsen production, which was that particularly sort of soupy, late afternoon light in Norway mm. when it's raining hard. And it was so exact and so precise. You understood precisely why these characters felt so mm. locked in and hemmed in. All I'm saying, theatre has this capacity to excavate <coughs> and recreate the past. And it's a pity if all we ever do is sort of look for present uh, equivalents. Yeah. Well, we had Trevor Griffiths here last night, uh -huh. and, and, and he was saying, don't get the design concept. <laughs> so, uh, I, I didn't quite know what he meant by that, as if there had to be a formula, as it were, that we yeah. could unpack, which was the equal, equal sign. It was at the interval. He was nicer at the end. Uh, but but uh, I, I, well, we've got, we, I, I started with this one from, from if we we're going to update it, we had an interesting question, which was that it ends with public executions. Right. And we actually don't have those. So the brief to the designer, uh, this probably shouldn't go into our recording, uh, was it's happening 20 years from now, Michael Gove is Prime Minister and street executions are back. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, <laughs> so we went from there. Uh, so it was actually the last scene. A dystopian vision of the yeah, future. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And 20 years might be, anyway. Uh, <laughs> so well, I'm, not, I'm not about your production, I'm talking about general no, observations. No, but, but, about but I feel I, on a self-defence mode, just no, like. No, no. no, I'm not, I'm not, no, I'm so not about just because I haven't seen it. Um, but I'm also talking about language, and I think our fear and apprehension of language. Um, but I do these plays because I love this language yes. and, and love the fact that it's brilliantly dramatic. Um, but I'm frightened that unless one actually puts enough explanatory devices in to keep the audience with you, then the audience will not rejoice in that language. But would the audience rejoice in it if the actors themselves exult in it? And no. relish it and save no, it. No, that's too general. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah, you can't do that with an actor. Uh, the, the, they have to actually, moment by moment, feel they're really in control of communication with an audience. Yeah. And if they actually feel, this is wonderful, but an audience is going to actually be puzzled moment by moment by what I'm saying, mm -hmm. then they're really blocked. I mean, in, in this, the, there is a scene, it's, uh, we renumbered it so we don't work by act. So, so scene eight, uh, in which quite suddenly there is a debate uh, about the nature of women's modesty. And I think the actress is doing it stunningly now, but, but she was initially worried that suddenly she was, as if in a Shaw play, she's suddenly shifting a, a lot of abstract argument. We've done lots of things about the relationships on stage to help her. And the actress in the audience, I think, will say she's doing it wonderfully now. But there, there was a worry I I in her head. Now, we have adjusted some of those speeches just very, very gently, because it's very complicated flowing argument. This is the first play in English which uses Florio's translation of Montaigne. So suddenly very advanced, complicated ideas explode into the play ab about 40 minutes in. And the play has not been talking like that. People have not been thinking like that. So there's, a, there's an energy behind it. And in the disastrous National Theatre production, Joyce Redman, who played Chris Pinella, yeah. scored massively with this role. Though I've gone through the prompt copy and they cut it far, far back beyond what we, we're doing. Um, 
But, so it is possible for that energy to follow through, but, but we needed with that actress to work quite hard that, no, they're going to be following you, it's fine. But there's, there's one dramatist we haven't, or scarcely mm. mentioned at all, who's a sort of key litmus test, I thought, Ben Johnson. Uh, Johnson's plays survive, if they do, partly because of the sort of richness <coughs> and density of the language. It's peppered, as you know, with classical allusions, which we don't always understand, isn't it? It's often technical language we don't understand. And yet there is a kind of energy and vitality in those plays that I, I don't want to see them <coughs> you know, rewritten or tinkered with too much. I mean, I haven't got in front of me, but you remember the speech of Sir Epicure Mammon, for example, is a brilliant speech, isn't it, when he has this voluptuous... Oh, the fantasy of... Uh, yes, voluptuous yes. fantasy, yes, of mm -hmm. his life. Um, naked succubi, I seem to remember, and all the rest of it. Do you remember Philip Voss delivering that mm. speech on the Stratford stage? And because Voss is an actor who relishes language, we therefore began to say with that language too. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. The, the uh, we, yes, we, we have one of the general editors, the new uh, Ben Johnson, the massive edition. Oh. So I look n nervously Wait. towards him at this moment. Uh, but, 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 well, the he, but he's a special case be because he cannibalises sub-dialects and he's actually not expecting the audience to follow him moment by right. moment. In fact, he's coming back saying, I've been there and you haven't, right. quite often. So you get the rhetorical energy of it. And, and, and as long as the actor plays precisely, that's the audience that, will trust. But I point. don't that's think point. that's generally the case, you see. I, I think Johnson is a category, uh, certainly that kind of speech. Yes. Uh, it, it's, it's actually the exoticism and the excluding you is part of it. Yes. Um, whereas I don't think that's how these guys work. Right. Um, but all I'm saying is that I don't want to see Ben Johnson diluted or rewritten or paraphrased. I want to hear we're thinking of a Ben Johnson next. This is okay, we'll do, <laughs> do the text is what I'm saying. I didn't know we had a Johnson scholar sitting in the house. Yes, he's, lo he's looking at you beside Peter there. Right. So, right. <laughs> so we ha have we time for the audience? I don't know. Do they yeah, yeah, I was going to... Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, that's because we've got, we've got so many either Martin or Peter. <laughs> we've, got, we've got so many experts sitting in the audience, and I, I feel nervous of pontificating about what actors should be so doing. So this is the moment when we solicit con conversation yes. with the audience. Or not. And there's a total silence. <laughs> right, <No. laughs> One-way conversation. See, they're bowing before you. No, no, they're not. No, no, we're, we're having a debate, aren't we? <laughs> I, I don't know who's... I don't know whether the audience is with us or not on this. I mean, do these plays need... What we're asking is, do these Elucidation plays or whatever. need, yes, amendment, it help, whatever. Help is the word that's used a lot these days, isn't it? Well, I... I was, read, no, I was reading an article um, in the Times this morning where someone was talking about children's theatre, and they said, oh, yes, we did a version of Peter Pan because Barry's play needs a bit of help these days. Well, I didn't think Barry's play did need much help. Well, you know, I thought it was I, I, sort of I, its own two feet. As well, I'd never say that. I don't think the master needs help. Uh, but, well, well, they're just, you know, it is 400 years. Yes. You know, the, the language has changed. Uh, some of the reference points that it's easy for him to assume mm -hmm. don't work at all for a modern audience. And sometimes, sorry, in a way I'm repeating that, sometimes those are critically placed. Yes. Um, the, the, the National Theatre back in 64 did odd things. I mean, the, the play opens just after uh, there's been a theft from a tavern. Some goblets have been taken. And they talk about goblets, and then they talk about plate, meaning the same thing. And in 1964, plate was changed to goblets when it turned up. Um, and we haven't done that. But, but th and that seemed to be odd that then that was a problem. I mean, it's on the edge, isn't it? If you say plate, you don't immediately think of that kind of tableware. Um, well, but in 64, I'd have thought it was still part of the language. Yes. What about classical illusions? I mean, all these plays are packed, aren't they? with classical illusions, and assume we've all read of it, you know, which we probably haven't today, but what do you do? Do you retain those illusions? Do you drop them? Do you rewrite them? What do you do? Well, this play has interesting ones because it's got Latin in it. Right. Some of which we've kept, some of which we've kept and translated, some of which we haven't. All I'm trying to suggest is I think we need to, you know, confront the difficulties, but not always, uh, not always simplify them. That's all I'm really suggesting. Yes. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I think there's a, there's a, a difference between amending and cl clarifying something and um, and re rewriting something, then you don't get the language. And so, but to make it clear so that you don't have the hump which leaves the audience behind you to such an extent that they're never going to catch up and then they won't be with you for the next for the next half hour, is very helpful. But I, I think that anything that takes you away from the language that is written mm -hmm. um, is sad because uh, actually that's why 
they are so brilliant. I mean, the Middleton voice is a very London voice, isn't it? As opposed Absolutely. to the Shakespeare voice, which is a very much more rural voice. And um, you could say the same with someone like Harold Pinter, which is a very, it's a very urban voice. And, and if you started to change it, or if you, it's certainly with his work, if you start to say it with an Irish accent, it d loses the sharpness of how he speaks. And I think it's very much the same with, your, with, with, with the plays you're discussing just now. Well, and, and what you said touches on something that hasn't come in, which is I would never change it in a way which damaged rhythm. No. Uh, so, for example, quite late in the play, there's a report of a trial, and, there's the, and the verdict has gone peremptorily in one direction because the judge got angry. And what they talk about is the cola of a judge, and we change that to anger. It just seems to me that's an unnecessary obstruction. And it, it, it's the same rhythm. Color. It's the same, yeah. yeah. Color. Yeah. Choleric. We use the word I, I, but, but you're doing a translation that most what? audience at that point oh. weren't. Well, I, I, I genuinely do think there's an issue here. That, 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 uh, I think the audience will follow anger much faster than cola. It's got the same rhythm. There are no language textures of assonance or anything around that that actually will be damaged by the change. One I think the actors. Lesson, one is doing a play. So, as you say, you have to keep a rhythm, otherwise, there's no. But writers, I mean, Alan writes with a very particular rhythm. And if you change that, and if you if you miss the rhythm, then you then you're really lost. You're even more lost than you were before. Because um, the rhythm can take you a long way. And Marston is a phenomenally rhythmic writer, with the rhythms constantly changing. I mean, this is a, a, a play that works on a very very nervous tempo. I mean, and very swiftly within a scene, you, you're suddenly onto a new rhythm. And I really really wouldn't ever do anything that that damage damage that. I mean, this is a whole new issue to bring up late in the day, but I mean, another fact, though, of, of all these plays is part of their fascination is their social portraiture, isn't it? I mean, mm. We touched on this, talked about Ben Johnson. Um, and a play like Mad World well, Masters, again, there's a, one of the characters that are called Penitent Brothel. And again, the contradiction is there in the name, isn't it? This is a man who is both lascivious and after someone's wife and at the same time suffers all kinds of... <laughs> after pangs. After pangs and yeah. self-mortifying <laughs> guilt. I mean, it's a rich, rich character. Of a, of, a, of a type, I presume, that was not uncommon in the age he was writing. Y you mean it's gone now? Well, I'm no, saying no, it's no, harder no. to find... When you put the play into the 1950s uh, Soho... But their particular I setting. Think, yeah, yes, but I think, yeah. well, what does penitent brothel mean in that context? Of course, there's always been religious hypocrisy and religious people have... I come, from, I come from Northern Ireland. Yes. So, I mean, so well, this, is, this is a familiar time. No, I, I just found that character seemed to me to be... Um, well, not explained in yeah, the world I of see, I can see that. London, where the point about Soho in 56 was a sudden permissiveness was in the air. Yeah. And people didn't necessarily feel guilt over their sexual... But that's an argument about misallocation in resetting, isn't it? It is. It's not an it argument is. about... Um, I, mean, <coughs> I, I mean, John Barton, for a time, was obsessed with the middle of the 19th century yes. and did, I think, two great productions, which relocated Othello and much ado there, yes, and there yes. was sheer gain. Yes. For example, I've never seen a production oh, of Othello yes. in which when Cass Cassio is cashiered, his shame was communicated so totally as a man who'd been in Victorian military uniform and had to come back to solicit his job in civvies. And we got it, totally. And production of Much Ado done in India yeah, in the Raj. Yeah. Yes, I couldn't agree more. But I've also seen other modernisations by John where I think, why did you do that? Uh, so, so, you know, it, it is always the particular decision um, yes. that, 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 that counts. I mean, in... in Dutch courtesan, there's a figure, not the same as Penitent and Brothel, he's sitting up there, uh, a, a guy who has all kinds of inhibitions about the world he might be sucked into uh, of the brothel, uh, and which critics by and large talk about as Puritan. And it seems to me there's no evidence in the text for that at all. But all the modern productions give him black and starched collars and make him wobbly. Um, what we hear in the text is a completely different character you'll see tonight, and, and we think richer. Uh, so actually, in that case, at least one use of the Jacobean in the few modern productions there have been seems to me seriously to stereotype yes, that character yes. and hold it down. And that can happen too, but because a director's understanding of the period is slightly off the peg, as it were. But there are very specific characters, like the Anabaptists, you know, in Ben Johnson's uh, The Alchemist, like Zeal of the Land Busy, but one of my favourite characters in Bar Barfum Fair, mm. isn't it? You know, those characters <coughs> seem to be to spring out of a particular moment in religious history, and it's not that easy to find 
uh, contemporary equivalents. No, it's, it's always a matter. Well, you said yourself that Bartholomew Fair probably. Yes. Uh, certainly, I've not seen a successful I'm novel. I haven't seen a successful production I'm of it, to be honest. I'm, <laughs> I'm, tr I'm, sh I'm sure I'm sounding or coming out more dogmatic than I mean to be. All I'm trying to say is do the plays, uh, think carefully about what period you set them in. And where possible, keep the language. That's all I'm really asking for when I look at Jacobin drama. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a concluding note. Oh, it wasn't <laughs> meant to be. Well, it's perfect timing. Oh, all right. Then. <laughs> if you want. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> 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 <laughs>